Hello, welcome once again. Uh, Wayne Hathaway here with uh, uh, Friday Night Study. Yeah, some good seeds, and uh, obviously I have a new face with me uh, for this one. This is my friend Bill Holdridge, and uh, he is, uh, I'm not sure exactly what your title is. Uh, are you the- Director. The director. Yeah. I, I thought that, but I didn't want to misspeak. He's the director of Poyman Ministries. And uh, for those people who are kind of in this circle of influence, this sphere of influence, that's a brand new uh, concept for them. So I, I want, first of all, for Bill, just to share a little bit about what Poyman is and what you do, and, and then we'll take it from there and just have a little time of fellowship here and share some good seeds. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I pastored in Monterey, California mm -hmm. for 27 years, started the church there, and then I, I stepped down or stepped aside, I prefer to say, yes. from that role in, in 2006. And the next phase of ministry for me was to uh, strengthen pastors. And the reason why that was on my heart, Wayne, was because I love the church like you love the mm -hmm. church. I'm you know, the bride of Christ, the right. pillar in the ground of the truth, yes. the salt and light to the world. I mean, there's nothing more important than the church Amen. as far as an entity on this on this earth. Amen. So the greatest predictor of a church's failure or success or health or weakness is how well the pastor's doing. <laughs> yes, So true. So I, uh, I just floated the idea to a couple of other guys that had retired from their churches mm -hmm. that, of 30 years or so. Right. And and Pat Kenny and Gillette Doggett, and they loved the idea. Mm -hmm. And so we formed Poyman Ministries back in 2008. And we've been going ever since. And now there are 12 uh, men on our team that do that. That's their mission in life is to strengthen pastors in a myriad of ways and it's been fun to watch how yes. that has all developed yeah, yeah. over the years in terms of what kind of things we do to actually right. strengthen pastors. Yeah, so that's what we do. Yeah, that's awesome. I, uh, Poyman, for those that may not know, explain Poyman. What is that? Well, it comes from the Greek word. It's a noun, poimen, and it is the Greek word translated in the New Testament, either shepherd or pastor, mm -hmm. synonymous. So in John 10, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he was saying, I am the good poimane. Mm. And when you get into the original, it's even more profound because Jesus said, I am the shepherd, the good one. Yes. I am the pastor, <laughs> the good one. I like it. And so he's the senior pastor in reality. Right. And all of us are under shepherds, but uh, we, we want to, of course, model our ministry after our head, which is Jesus Amen. himself. Amen. That's just awesome. And some of the things that you <clears throat> that you in, are involved in uh, talk about some of those kinds of expressions that that takes in terms of pastors helping pastors well the biggest thing that we do is is off the radar and that is that we just love to connect with pastors mm -hmm. and wherever we are whether it's a zoom call a facetime call a phone call a pastor's conference taking those of us that have travel trailers, taking our travel trailer around our area, uh -huh. around a couple of states and visiting pastors, whatever it might be. Those one-on-ones are precious because so many pastors don't have connections. Right. Like you you talk about the state of Montana. Yeah, long ways between places. <laughs> exactly. And some of these guys feel very alone. Yes. So to have a phone call from somebody that has no agenda, right. is safe, all they care about is what that guy yeah. uh, needs and wants and just fellowship with them with no no expectation at all. Yeah. So that that's the bread and butter. That that starts everything. But from that, we've we've had an awful lot of requests for pastoral coaching, hmm. for mentoring, for church assessments where we come in as another set of eyes to that church and right. spend a week with them and just look at everything they want us to look at. Uh, we've had we've been involved in a number of church transitions. Remarkably, we didn't expect that. But, right. You know, probably we've helped in around sixty church transitions oh, wow. That's of, awesome. of Calvary Chapel churches. Yeah. Over the years. So. Well, because the reality of it is, uh, the last pastors conference I went to, uh, there was a lot of gray hair there. A lot of gray hair. Yeah, <laughs> the, that's right. The, the graying of the of the movement, <laughs> and so we, uh, and myself included in that. Yeah, so yeah. that that is interesting, and so transitioning becomes a real, real important aspect of the ministry. It does. Because it affects not just the pastor, it has a dramatic impact on the church itself. Yeah, early in, uh, in our transitional part of what we do, 
And we're a lot of people think that that's what we are as a transitional group. <laughs> just one but aspect. It's just one aspect. But um, what happened was that a friend of mine, who's not a Calvary Chapel guy, but he was he was very high up in in a certain Baptist denomination. Wonderful brother. He retired from his role, and he started transitioning churches. Hmm. Churches of fifteen hundred or more. Whoa. It would take him probably a year to year and a half to yeah. do a church. Yeah. Because different church government and sure. approach to things. And so he coined the the phrase or term transitional senior pastor. Hmm. And he wrote an article that he could present to these churches that were looking for mm -hmm. help called You Need a TSB. You <laughs> need a transitional senior pastor. And the reason that churches need a transitional senior pastor is because they're not ready to do the process themselves. Right. And uh, usually there are a lot of mistakes that are made that could have been avoided. Yes. So we, in, we involve ourselves at the request of the pastor uh, who's going out and uh, of his board, of course. And we're involved either as an on-site, we take over your church, you leave, uh, we pastor your church until we help them get to the place where they're ready to start looking for their next pastor. <laughs> That's the most extreme involvement. And then the less extreme would be to do it from a distance and just help them yeah. uh, go through steps properly. I smile at that because I think of myself trying to let go of that in that situation. And I imagine some pastors have a little difficulty in releasing that to somebody oh, else. There's no doubt. I mean, the very first question I ask a pastor who wants help with transition is is do you want to be a material part of the transition or are you are you wanting not to be part of it at all mm. or and leave it to somebody else or is it a combination of the two right. and we have to work that out and sure. there are a number of pastors who say yeah i want to be involved i think i really need to be involved great we'll help them be involved but then they'll get into it after about a month or so and they'll go, I don't think I want to get involved. <laughs> yeah, this isn't what I expected. Well, it's a lot of work. It is. It's yep. a lot of work and you're dealing with a lot of people yep. and the, the the loss of their senior pastor mm -hmm. or the departure of their senior pastor is a big, big deal for yeah. churches. And if the senior pastor is moving on to something that everybody in the church sees it and they go, wow, that is a great fit. Yeah, Pastoring was a great fit, but that's a great fit too. We're so happy our pastor is moving on to the next phase of yeah. his, yeah. his ministry life. That helps, that helps the church. Yeah. But in a case where the tragic cases we've had to deal with, like the death of a pastor, yeah. an untimely death, or an immoral problem or mm. an ethical problem that he has to leave. Yeah. Uh, those are horrible, and they take a lot of work yeah. to, to write that ship. Well, there are so many um, variations, uh, almost as many as there are people yeah, in the right. church that, right. ha that are reacting to whatever it is in a different way. Yeah. And so uh, it's, uh, in some cases, almost a, maybe a no-win situation because you're not going to be able to please everybody. You can't. And uh, <clears throat> makes it a little more uh, challenging in that regard. Yeah. Right. Well, uh let me just talk about switch gears a little bit. You know, we have. A, 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 I hope that gives people a good idea of appointment and, and what is taking place. Talk a little bit about what you see going on in the church broad, uh, in this country particularly. Things that trends possibly that you may see or uh, situations that are happening that that we could address in terms of a. What do we pray about? How do we help out in that? What do we see coming as far as the future is concerned in the church? Right. Well, you know, if if the political situation in our nation continues on the course that it's yeah. currently on, then we're looking at at restrictions and maybe even severe restrictions and maybe even Dracu Draculan. Draconian. Draconian. There yeah. we go. That's the word. That was that was Dra Dracula's brother. Dra <laughs> Dracula, <so. laughs> Maybe even draconian <laughs> restrictions, which basically would eliminate our freedom. So yeah. we're looking at things that could force the church to go, at some level, underground. Yeah. And so that's going to be a big deal. So who's going to survive a culture where it's already intense? Mm -hmm. It's a cancel culture. Yes. It's a critical race theory culture oh, and all of these kinds of things that are yeah. just basically lies. You're right, they're, they they're, are. They're lies from they the pit. From the pit, that's yeah. right. So we're there already. So if it continues on that course, then will the church be strong enough 
as individual believers mm -hmm. and as individual entities called local churches, will they be strong enough yeah. to stand in the face of persecution, marginalization, oppression, right. and draconian measures? Yeah. And I think that right now, as it stands, the church is really in trouble mm. over, overall nationwide. And I the agree. reason for it is because they are so biblically illiterate as That's a whole. It. That's it. And, and, you know, Calvary chapels, of course, are known for their exposition of scripture right. and how important that is. So somebody can attend a Calvary chapel or a Calvary chapel-like church and learn more in a month than they learned in years in the church that just did, right. you know, uh, sermonettes for Christianettes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So teaching the Bible and uh, teaching theology and teaching people the character of God, that's the great need of the church. So. I think that we need to pray for the pulpits of America. That's Amen. the bottom line. We need yeah. to pray for the pulpits of America. And along with that, the leadership teams of every church, that we would be biblical in our approach to leading our congregations. Yeah. We can't just make it up. No. This isn't a postmodern make up church as you go. Throw it up against the wall and see what sticks. Or, or look around <laughs> yeah. to see which of the churches that have the most people in our neighborhood or in our city. Let's do it like they're doing. Right. You know, that's that's what's been going on. Right. We have to look backwards to the apostles, which was the best church, the apostolic church. Right. And say, what were their values? And there are seven values in Acts chapter 2. Yes. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. so walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's evangelism. There's the apostles' teaching that they were addicted to. Exactly. And there's the fellowship, true fellowship, sharing mm -hmm. our lives with one right. another. There's breaking of bread, which is common meals and communion and prayers. Yes. And the seventh. Water baptism, yes. which is often neglected that because water baptism in every culture in the world, except for cultures that have freedom, is a huge step. You take that step of water baptism, you may be forfeiting your life. That's right. Or putting it in danger. Yes. So that's a that's a commitment thing that was certainly very true of the first century Jewish yes. believers in Jerusalem. Absolutely, because for them that was that was not just, you know, go get dunked. That was you were making a public statement you were. that could in fact cost you your life. And that meant we are leaving the structures of Jerusalem that yes. we've learned growing up through the Pharisees and right. the and the rabbis and the, the scribes. Right. We're leaving that to go for Rabbi Jesus yes. exclusively. Yeah. We're going to follow him. And that got a lot of people in trouble, including those that fell under Paul the Apostles, right. uh, who was Saul of Tarsus before yes. that. Yeah. And he made sure that a lot of them were bound up and sent to prison and even said he was consenting to their death. Right. So. Well, I'm glad you said that because that persecution that came as a result of Saul of Tarsus, as we both know, ended up launching the church out exactly. into the rest of the world. Yeah. They these, probably, men, <laughs> these men who have turned the world upside down have come here have also. Have come here also, yeah. And had they not had that kind yeah. of persecution, maybe they would have stayed in relative comfort yeah. in Jerusalem and not gone out and fulfilled the Judea and Samaria and uttermost parts, parts of the, the world yeah. part that Jesus talked yeah. about. Yeah. And, and interesting that it took that uh took that persecution for that to happen, for yeah. them to go into all the world. So yeah. it was a, an interesting component, which which really causes me to question about what's going to happen here. Yeah. We've already talked about these draconian methods and all this stuff that we can we can see coming down the pike and, and know that that's potentially what's going to happen here. Is it going to take that for us? We yeah. Got, we got some fun We kids. have some visitors here, some yeah. Yeah, they're dog. playing on their skateboards right. and their scooters. scooters yep. Yeah. So uh, anyway, back to the, the question of what's going on now that we see, and uh, is that a possibility even in this country? I mean, that that is so almost like far-fetched. And, and I think that that lends itself to our lack of preparation because we just don't, think that that could possibly happen. I mean, America, land of the free, home of the brave, you know, that we've always enjoyed this freedom, but those things are being brought to question and brought uh, new pressure that maybe we've never really felt before. Well, I agree. And, you know, you live in a, in mostly a conservative state. Yes. Here we are in East Texas as mm -hmm. we're recording this. It's a very conservative area, conservative with regard to the Constitution. Right believing that it's a valid document that exactly. God had something yep. to do with, and so on and so forth. So in places like that, 
it's hard to imagine. It is. But when we're looking at the federal scene, oh, man. and especially the coast, the, yes. east, the left coast east. and the east coast, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's easy to see yeah. how, how these kinds of things have happened. And we're living in a culture of lies. That's right. And I know you're perusing a book that yeah. is on my bookshelf, Live Not By Lies by right. Rod Dreher. Yeah. But that's, that's his whole premise in the book is right. that under totalitarianism, however, it's named is it soft totalitarianism or is it hardcore totalitarianism as an extreme soviet or right. chinese totalitarianism uh, wh whatever the case may be when that's the case we christians have got to refuse to live according to the lies and the propaganda machine that they've been told yep. and if living not by lies means going underground and getting off the grid, then that may mean yeah. what we have to do. But we have to live out our lives as Christians. We have to live out loud yes. without being stupid about it. That's And that has to be the basis for our living is the word of God. It I'm is. not going to just stand up and wave my flag and say I'm a conservative Christian because I'm an American. I, yeah. I, I happen to be an American who is a Christian first. Yeah, exactly. And, that, that, and when you look at the early church, that was the standard for them. They were Christians first, and it was a result of that. And certainly... They suffered persecution, had to go underground, uh, all of those kinds of things. And we have to be Christians first and citizens of the country second. And so it's back to the pulpits of America issue because how many pulpits are afraid to talk about how abortion is evil? Exactly. Or how uh, excessive taxation by the government yeah. is illegal and Or the government evil. not caring for the people as it's mandated Ex by God exactly. to do. Exactly. Or when the government breaks the laws of our land right. by, by breaking the laws of the Constitution, which is our legal document. Exactly. So when that happens, pulpits are afraid to speak out because they've won, uh, many pulpits have won people to their congregation through pablum and through very weak sermons yes. and you know like i said christian sermon nuts for christian ads. yeah and you win them that way you got to keep them that way exactly so if they speak up then there's going to be a significant and sometimes a significant financial base in those churches that is going to say bye bye yeah sayonara i've got and all this facility and all of these people yes. and my job has become how do I keep them? How do I keep them? And right. uh, so when that becomes threatened by the kinds of things that we're talking about, there has to be a real decision that's made on the past, on the part of the pastor. Absolutely. And pastors, so pastors can't live by lies either. No. I, how can I stand in the pulpit behind, with the Word of God in front of me and open up that book, God's book, His very breathed out word to yes. us, and say, I represent Him, and not give the whole counsel of God. That's it. Or be afraid to say something that God has said in his word. Yeah. If I'm afraid and I'm not willing to do it, I am misrepresenting the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm misrepresenting his kingdom. And I'm a coward. Yeah. And it, and it really goes to what, what Paul said to Timothy. There, in the last days, there are going to be those who are going to heap to themselves <laughs> teachers who are going to say what their itching ears want to hear. That's the pablum aspect that you were talking about, or sermonettes for Christianettes, because we don't want to be confronted with truth. Right. And it's just uh, uh, Pastor uh, John, where we attended church on Sunday, yeah. really did an excellent job of talking <laughs> about and defining truth and making a statement about truth. Man, that was just, that was awesome. Yeah. Because that's what it comes down to. Am I going to live by the truth? Or like the book that you mentioned, uh, am I going to live not by lies, and that's living according to the truth. Right. And right. Uh, so what can we do to encourage people? Uh, what do, what word of encouragement do we give to the average Joe Christian sitting in the pew, uh, people that are, you know, guys that watch some good seeds and uh, that I've tried to encourage? What can we encourage them with? I mean, this this is a daunting thing that is taking place, and I I, be, I really believe it's it's last days scenarios. It is stuff. last days, yeah. And so in the face of what is coming, a lot of people just don't see it coming. And, they, and you know, Bill, I think don't want to see it coming. It's almost like the ostrich, you know, with his head in the sand kind of thing. But there are going to be those people who are in tune and touch and, and want to know, well, what do I do in the face of that? Right. Well, back to the itching ears comment that you made, Wayne. Uh, many will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears who will turn their hearts away from the truth. So what would happen, just best case scenario, what would happen if every true believer, every regenerate person in the United States said, I am not going to be part of a church 
or give credence yeah. to a church where my pastor is not willing to preach the whole counsel of God. Right. I'm going to, that's what I'm going to say to him. I'm going to say, we want you to open up the scriptures to us and we don't want you to hide anything. We mm. want you to explain everything. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of church we're going to go to. So what happens is they start leaving the unhealthy compromised churches. Right. And they join congregations that want to be healthy and want to not compromise. Right. So the market for the false teachers goes away. <laughs> they yeah. couldn't exist unless they, they were yeah, itching absolutely. ears. Absolutely. So the market goes away and it forces pastors. I do believe that most pastors want to do the right thing. Yeah, that's I do my hope believe too. that yeah. most pastors want to want to raise up healthy believers. They care about people. They, they do. Would, they they wouldn't be in people. this profession if they, they didn't. Exactly. Uh, but I think they've been trained wrong, and, and I think that they've not been exposed to the to the idea that Paul the Apostle had himself. He said, I have not shunned to declare to you yeah, the, whole the whole counsel, counsel of God. Right. I'm going to give you everything. Jesus on the road to Emmaus opened the scriptures from Moses and the entire law and the prophets, yeah. all the things concerning himself. Right. He shared with them the word of God. That's what we need to do. Yeah. And the response did not our hearts burn within us exactly. while he expounded the scriptures to us. And and that that speaks to a need within the heart of each and every individual. There's that longing for truth. Jesus said, the truth will set you free. And so that truth of the word of God is not my opinions about this, that, or the other thing, or all kinds of different topics. Not that topical preaching is not, there's not benefit and blessing in that, but it's just going through the scriptures verse by verse and, and expanding that and expounding that and what that does in terms of causing the heart and soul of the people who are listening to be blessed and encouraged by what they're hearing. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. And the, the, the scriptures themselves have this inherent power to cause spiritual growth. Isn't it amazing? It is. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So it'll happen and, and people will have to learn how to trust the Holy Spirit yeah. as they learn the word. But it, it's imperative. It's absolutely imperative. And what I'm trying to do is encourage people to get into the Word because it has that kind of, of effect on us because the Holy Spirit will move upon His Word and, and uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, in, well, I, for lack of a better, endure it to our hearts, mm -hmm. uh, satisfies a hunger within us that, that is God-born. It's what God put in us, a desire for His Word. And as we expose ourselves to it, it, it is the... It is the change agent for our lives. Yeah, yeah, right. It right. has the power to do that like nothing else. Man shall not live by bread only, but by every word that yeah, proceeds from the mouth, the mouth of, God. of God. And that's the key for it. I think that's the big need in today because the word, you know, it, what it does is it equips us. It, it gives us doctrine. It, it rebukes us. It corrects us. Wow. And it gives us the tools to be equipped for every good work. Yeah. Right? So if a good work that we have to be equipped for is how to experience suffering for Jesus. Boy. And if the good work that that we have to be equipped for is how to answer those that are our enemies mm -hmm. or how to do good for those who persecute you, right. persecute us, uh, what level of maturity must I attain to to be that type of believer? Boy. And only the Word can do that That's for right. us. That's only right. Only the Word and the Holy Spirit, of course, making application of the Word. So you take the Word and the Spirit and the character of Christ, put those together. That's the formula. It is. And we can't know Jesus apart from the Word, and we can't know the Word and the, its illumination apart from Jesus. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and what does Peter say? Everything that we need for life and godliness, where does that come from? Yeah. It's from our knowledge of him. Where do we gain that knowledge? Yeah. Well, I can sit out in the woods uh, all day long for months on end and not gain the knowledge that I would from just opening the scriptures and meditating on right. the word of God. Right. Right. I mean, I, I can observe and design, designer, that can, is yeah. a part of helping convince me that there's a creator, that there's, there's a God, but boy, when I opened the Word, that's when I really began to know Him yeah. and understand His plan, His principles, uh, to put my trust in Him. He's been faithful in the past. He's going to be faithful. I read the accounts of the Old Testament and see uh, what happened there, and I learn from that as Paul admonished us in Romans 15. Uh, so it, the Word becomes critical to our lives and to everything that we do. And isn't it interesting that that's probably one of the areas where 
believers today are maybe the weakest. I know, I know. And in fellowship. Yeah. Fellowship is not pot potlucks and social times. No. True fellowship is sharing life. Yeah. And so that's another one of these pillars that yes. are necessary right. from Acts chapter 2, fellowship. So John describes it. He says, these things we write to you that you might have fellowship with us. Mm -hmm. And truly our fellowship is with the Father right. and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that your joy might be made made full yeah. and so when we learn to share our lives like you and I are doing right now yeah when we learn to share our lives with one another bear one another's burden exactly. really pray for one another, care about one another there's a depth of growth that happens almost uh, exponentially mm -hmm. combine that with the word people take off yeah they take off in their spiritual growth but the people that are isolating mm. You know, the Bible says he who isolates himself is seeks his own desire. Right. People who are isolating are only in it for themselves. Yes. People that are separate. Did you know, Christian, whoever's watching this, that you owe a debt? Yeah. You know what your debt is? Your debt is the same debt I have. I owe a debt to Wayne to love him as my brother. Mm -hmm. I owe a debt to every Christian that comes within my world. Yep. To, to love them exactly and and if I do that then I'll never harm you mm -hmm. and you know love does no harm to his neighbor therefore right. love is the fulfillment of the law Amen. so I, I just think that the fellowship thing is is vital as well it and is. we need dependence upon the Holy Spirit that's what made the Apostles the Apostles pre baptism of the Holy Spirit yes. they were ineffective yeah and thank God they obeyed that commandment to stay in Jerusalem for 10 days until Pentecost came. Amen. Yeah, what a great time. <laughs> if yeah. they'd have gone out and tried to win the world oh. or live for Jesus apart from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, well, they would have gone have right off the edge of the table, wouldn't they it? They couldn't have done it. And, and done. isn't it interesting, as, as you talk about isolation, a trick of the enemy is to do what? Separate us, Separate isolate us. us. And we've certainly, for the last year, experienced that as a nation, You know, well, the world, yeah. you know, the isolation. But God is bigger than that, and yeah. we are finding, I think one of the things that has happened through that is we're finding new ways to connect with each other. That's Even good. sometimes it may be on a screen like this yeah. because we've been forced to that, but yet even there we can make that connection yeah. uh, much better in, in person, obviously, oh, because yeah. you know we as humans we crave touch and all of those uh, important components that make up fellowship. Yeah. But... Uh, I, I'm I'm thrilled to have an opportunity like this, as I've been doing now for these months, to be able to. Uh, I've retired, you know, and so my functioning where I'm not, uh, where I'm touching people, as it were, driven kind of apart, isolated from all that, uh, by not being able to go to church anywhere, but yet we still are able to connect, and that's the work of the Spirit of God, and and when we can get together like this, even even better. Yeah, yeah. So I love that aspect yeah, of it. Yeah, Praise yeah, the Lord. Yeah, so I good. just want to encourage people, boy, don't, as, as the writer of Hebrews says, depending on whoever you think that may be, mm -hmm. uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Mm -hmm. It really is a very, very key aspect, the fellowship aspect of that, not just in the church building, yeah. for, for sure. I mean, if that were it, then, you know, we've missed a whole aspect of yeah, it. Yeah. But get together, fellowship. Yeah. They, What did they do in Acts chapter 2? They went from house, house to, to house, house yes. doing those very kinds yeah. of things. And they were steadfast. They yeah. continued yeah. steadfastly in, in fellowship yeah. and in these other things. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a great thing uh, to be a part of the family of God. Amen. Uh, you know, as, a, as an individual, the church became my family, and that I loved Every time the doors were open, I, as a as a young person, I was there. Uh, I would even <laughs> sometimes I can remember I would even go to the Thursday morning prayer meeting when there were there was no one there but the whitehead white haired sisters with the little buns on the back. God bless you know? them. Amen. <laughs> well, I I covet the prayers of those saints. Amen. They were they. Amen. Get they on their a, prayer list. Amen. <laughs> well, nothing like being on that list, you know. And when I I knew there were half a dozen of those ladies that were praying for me all the time. So. But to be able to fellowship together is just just really key, and I'm I'm thankful to the Lord for that. There's something else I just want to add real quick. And yes, this please is going to be throwing in a a, a torch in yeah. the middle of a. We'll take as long as you like. Let's burn this well, thing no, down. No, no, this is this <laughs> something that has been increasingly on my heart. I think that a major thing that is hindering the church in America today, aside from the things we've already talking about, is a lack of forgiveness. Mm. 
I do. I think it's killing churches. I, boy, I couldn't agree more. You take somebody who's in a church and they get angry at somebody in the church or they get angry at the pastor or they don't get their way and they leave and they're all of a sudden offended and maybe they really were damaged sure. or hurt. You know, you maybe they truly were offended. But di didn't Jesus say, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you your tresp trespasses. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive your trespasses. Yep. We're not talking about salvation now. No. But we are talking about severe consequences Absolutely. to those that refuse to forgive. Yep. And so that unforgiving person goes to a new congregation. And it's impossible, but that lack of forgiveness somehow morphs into... Uh, you know, he takes other, it with him. Yeah. Other kinds of things, yeah. yeah. And uh, bitterness being the number one thing. Absolutely. And that bitterness poisons everybody else. So we need to forgive. We, er, I need to forgive everybody who's ever done anything to me specifically for the thing that is that they've done. That doesn't mean I have to physically go to every person and right. tell them their fault. No. But <laughs> it does mean that I, I from my heart, like Jesus yes. said in, in Mark 11, I from my heart must forgive all men, no matter who they are, believer yeah. or unbeliever, or what they're done, about, or what they've done, yeah. and you know, we're free that way. We need a free church. Amen. We need a church Amen. that is unencumbered, unencumbered by by damaging things like unforgiveness right. and bitterness. Right. And that's killing the church. And just imagine an environment where if we do have to go more underground mm. and, and we're the persecuted church, so we show up in a fellowship group and there's somebody that I haven't forgiven yet. Well, you're going to have to do business with them right then Absolutely. if you're going to be in that group. Yep. And your life is going to be depending upon it. Right. So, hey, <laughs> let's do this thing. Let's and, do it now. And it's not optional. It is not optional. And, and the other thing about it is is, is that um, having not not having an option whether to forgive the amount of hurt that has been uh, given is is irrelevant forgiveness is forgiveness right. uh, and and I've had people say to me but you know you don't know what they did and my kind of my response is you know I really don't care what they did I mean I do care yeah. but the point of it is it doesn't matter what it is we are to forgive and I, and I think an important aspect of that is as we have been forgiven all we have to do is read uh the parable of the the king and the and his servant in yeah. matthew 18 yeah. matthew 18 oh. verses 21 through 35 yeah tremendous we owe a debt to god we owed a debt to god that was absolutely completely unpayable yeah yet we've been forgiven of all of it yeah. even the sins we haven't we haven't committed yet we're forgiven of those yeah it's amazing and then we go out and somebody owes us a pittance and we don't forgive them yeah well you know the lord doesn't take kindly to that no no he, he doesn't. expects he expects the gospel to be the core of our forgiveness of somebody else yes. i've been forgiven through christ and what he did i need to extend that to others Absolutely. i can extend it to others yeah, yeah. and that's where we're free and Amen. that's where we set other people free too. so Thanks i would so add much. that into the seven distinctives yes. of Acts chapter two. <laughs> let's get this thing it right is because important. it's going to be needed in the yeah. future because nothing uh, you know i don't know you know in my years of ministry i i don't know that i've ever come across anything that so binds a person up stunts growth keeps them from experiencing god like i think they would like to as bitterness and unforgiveness right, right. It, it is a it's great a great detractor yeah, yeah to anything that's good praise the lord wow that's a that's a bunch for us to think about today it's awesome uh, I'm just so thankful for Bill and for the ministry, uh, Hoyman Ministry, and uh, the exposure that I've had to it personally over the years. And uh, uh, knowing uh, some of the things that they do, it's just an awesome, awesome thing. And so I want to be an encouragement to the body of Christ, whether you're, uh, if you happen to be a pastor today boy, and need some encouragement, there's just, who are you going to call? You know, they call, not the Ghostbusters, but to call appointment guys. <laughs> They'll give you some encouragement. But it's just, it's awesome. But the, 
but for each and every one of us, uh, as I so often say, the thing that is so important for us is that we need to be people of the Word, yeah. men and women who know the Word, who know what we believe and why we believe it, because the days that are coming are difficult days. That, and, and I love, we were talking about this the other day. That doesn't mean that God isn't doing tremendous things. Oh, man. Because he's... if we just watch the news and all that, oh, man, it's a downer. It's a bummer when we think, man, is there anything good going on? Well, just my time here in Lindale for the last couple of days has exposed me to some aspects of ministry that are going on here in this very area that are mind-blowing, mind-boggling in terms of the scope and the potential for outreach that is taking place. Oh my, it's wonderful to think about. There's stuff with YWAM, with uh, JAMA, which stands for again? Jesus Awakening Movement for America. Yeah, just great stuff on this campus. And what is this campus again? It's where well, Keith, Keith Green and Last Days Ministries, yeah. we're actually sitting in a building on the property that Last Days Ministries once occupied, 471 acres, and then Teen Mania mm -hmm. after that. Now JAMA Global owns this property. Right. And it's going to be, and has been already, a launching pad for discipleship and kingdom building. Yeah. God's moving. Yeah. Uh, and he is moving in these last days. Yeah. We may not see... Uh, a national, what we would maybe call a national revival that would turn this nation back to God. I, I think that horse is already out of the barn, but that doesn't mean God isn't doing stuff. No, he is doing stuff. Moving by his spirit. And globally. And globally, it's yeah. It's amazing. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us for the study on Friday night. A little different than we normally do. And uh, by next Friday night, we'll be, get back into Romans chapter 1, and we'll be all the way into verses uh, 6 and 7. Hey, and share this. Share this on your Facebook yeah, page, do, on your please. Twitter feed, like on us your on Instagram, Facebook. Ac yeah. Instagram account, yeah. whatever you you use. Share it because, uh, you know, we're, we want to strengthen the church. Amen. That's the goal. Yeah. Uh, be a blessing. Appreciate you, Pastor Wayne. Well, likewise, Brother yeah. Bill. I yeah. mean, it's just great. And it's been wonderful for me just to be hanging out with them for the last couple of days, and they have graciously allowed us into their home, and we've enjoyed our fellowship tremendously. So, amen. Well, uh, as Pastor Chuck used to say, and I, I picked it up, and i not even realizing that I, I just do it all the time. May the Lord richly bless you yeah. in all that you're doing, and uh, we are just thankful for this opportunity to be amen. with you today. Amen. amen. God bless.